during the Second World War. But there is another darker side to the history of the RAF. During the 1920s and 30s, the Air Force saw regular active service, not in openly declared wars, but in suppressing rebellions against British colonial rule. RAF squadrons were ordered to bomb and machine gun tribal villages to crush revolt and hold together the far-flung borders of the empire. Some of the first RAF bombing raids in the 1920s were on the town of Rowan Doos in northern Iraq. After the end of the First World War, the Kurdish tribespeople in the area started a guerrilla war against British rule. The area was inaccessible to ground troops, so RAF aircraft were ordered to put down the rebellion by bombing. To find out more about this RAF bombing in Kurdistan, we crossed illegally into Iraq with the Kurdish rebels. This part of Kurdistan was recently the scene of heavy fighting between the Kurds and the Iraqi army. To escape the war, hundreds of thousands of refugees left the area. To date, only a few have returned. In spite of this disruption, we found some people still living in the region who remember the British bombing 70 years ago. <laughs> This rare archive film of the RAF in Iraq was discovered only recently. In the 1920s, bomber squadrons were based at makeshift runways near the rebel Kurdish areas. We uh, used to start flying at 7 o'clock in the morning, and uh, quite often one would get a signal stating that a certain Kurdish village had to be bombed. to fly in pairs because with little or no radio telephony, we had to keep in touch. Otherwise, if one of us went down, no one would know where they'd gone. And we'd fly up to the village and we would then fly over in turn and drop our bombs and go down as low as we can to see that our bombs had actually hit the target. The pilots were ordered to machine gun any Kurds who looked hostile. You can identify them quite easily, and if they're not um, villagers carrying on with a normal business and they're carrying arms, then they ought not to be. 
And uh, if they were doing something you could see that they ought not to be doing, then you, then you shot them. I was in the RAF. I had a job to do. My loyalty was to my commanding officer, who gave me my orders. <laughs> if the Kurds hadn't learned by our e example to behave themselves in a civilized way, then we had to spank their bottoms. And this was done by bombs and guns. One junior officer involved was Wing Commander Arthur Harris, later famous as head of wartime bomber command. In 1924, he wrote of these operations, the Arab and Kurd now know what real bombing means in casualties and damage. Within 45 minutes, a full-sized village can be practically wiped out and a third of its inhabitants killed or injured by four or five machines. The RAF was sent to Iraq as a result of the breakup of the Ottoman Empire at the end of the First World War. Britain and France were given mandates to rule Turkey's former territories. France was given control of modern-day Syria and Lebanon, and Britain was given Iraq, Jordan and Palestine. Not everyone living in the Middle East was content to exchange one empire for another. The Kurds, a people with their own language and culture, pressed for independence. But unfortunately for them, oil had been discovered in large quantities in Kurdish territory around the city of Kirkuk. The British wanted to keep these reserves under their control. They feared that an independent Kurdistan might use its oil wealth to threaten British power in the Middle East. So they joined Kurdistan with two other provinces to invent a new country, Iraq. Many Kurds objected to this arrangement. Ahmed Hoxha was a leading figure in the Kurdish independence movement. <laughs> Led by Sheikh Mahmoud, the Kurds rose in rebellion. Just after the end of the Great War, Britain was faced with the huge cost of sending troops to hold together the new state of Iraq. The Kurdish rebellion was a major crisis for the government in London. The minister responsible for Iraq was Winston Churchill. In 1921, he called a Middle East conference in Cairo to discuss the situation. Among those invited was Lawrence of Arabia. The main problem was casualties. After the carnage of the Great War, Churchill was extremely reluctant to risk thousands of British lives for Iraq, a country about which most Britons cared little. The answer to this crisis came from the RAF. The chief of the air staff, Sir Hugh Trenchard, persuaded Churchill to adopt a revolutionary scheme. He proposed sending RAF bomber squadrons to crush the rebellion from the air. The bombers would be cheap, and there'd be few British casualties. Churchill was the air minister at that time, and it was a question of whether um, the, the country at that time could afford to keep the, the standing army that we had in Iraq. I think it amounted something like about uh, 13 battalions of infantry, uh, 
God knows how many battalions of artillery. And the Air Force Trenchard uh, told Churchill that he thought that he could take over the responsibility of running the country and they could bring the, the army completely out of it and therefore save a lot of money. Because I think at that time there was a great deal of thought in, in the country that we wanted to get the hell out of it and, and let the Arabs get on with it. We were pretty well bankrupt after the First World War, but we had plenty of aircraft and a lot of keen young pilots still keen to fly. So they decided to try, instead of having an occupation force, which means a crowd of troops on the ground, they decided to hand over the whole of the running of Iraq with the RAF. The Air Ministry in London regarded RAF operations in Kurdistan as an excellent training ground. New weapons were developed for use in the area, amongst them the forerunners of napalm and air-to-ground missiles. The Ministry drew up a list of possible weapons. Phosphorus bombs, war rockets, metal crow's feet to maim livestock, man-killing shrapnel, liquid fire and delay-action bombs. Many of these weapons were first put into use by the RAF in Kurdistan. As soon as they knew we were coming over to bomb, they went up to the hills and sat in their caves. Well, we got to know this, so eventually what they did was to drop delay-action bombs so that they'd have a 24-hour delay on a, on a, on a 112 pound bomb. So the natives sort of, having cleared off out of the village during the bombing, would eventually return and possibly be holding a powwow sitting on the actual bomb when up it went, you see, and took a few with them. In the bombing, the RAF drew little distinction between civilians and combatants. Bombs dropped on a town could kill innocent civilians as easily as rebel tribesmen. Senior RAF officers believed that by destroying villages and creating refugees, pressure would be put on the rebels to make peace. One squadron leader wrote of the tactics. Driven from his village, the tribesman is stripped at a blow of all that makes life tolerable. If to the deprivation of all the necessities of life is added exposure to rain and cold, it will be appreciated that air operations conducted in the winter and spring have the maximum in moral and physical effect on Kurdish tribes. In spite of the hardships involved, the Kurds continued their rebellion. The city of Suleimania, recently one of the centers of the Kurdish uprising against Saddam Hussein, was also the headquarters of Sheikh Mahmoud's rebellion in the 1920s. The British were increasingly frustrated by Mahmoud's success. This air ministry memo details the situation. Conditions in the Suleimania area remain unsatisfactory. Sheikh Mahmoud persists in his disobedience of government orders. The people of Suleimania have been notified that as a result of the above, Suleimania will be bombed. Aircraft were then sent to drop leaflets over the city, warning the population that the RAF was about to bomb it. But with no experience of air raids, few people took any notice. The 
Rama kebab kolan, kolan hatta sini kenari ini wan sifirin, kafafu. Mau kolan Rama ke Rama ke fiaya ke tu bu, mai tu bu. خالو زاکه اوتی آو تیبه شرطی به شعر. تی نورا تی نورا آونی امکیه. چی بولاد تر و نجنیک لمالی ساهن چی فن حاجمین تراب و هات و در وسط برو خور برجه تا آو رحمانی به باشه و خور برجه کسی بوم باخلی یا کجا؟ اما شرما آن کرب پی خاصی کلان و کلان. پنج مال بو همو مالک می تجیتیم. یه چه لوانه جنی حاجی فرج شالی بو مرد بو. آفرت اگلو دیوانه او بو من خوام چم سیرم کرد. دمو چای پرچه پرچه بو دستی امانه همو لیب بو. امانه همو لیب بو و دستی اوالی اکر قاچشی اولا بنا قرطا بو. چاورم کرد با دیار وستام هتا روحی درشم. شو هر شو بزی خو من کرد و بجورا شو اشونه حمام و شو اشون نانی آن کرد دیان خورد و من روشی چه اون یا که نترسه هر بشو ایشی آن کرد لب مارو نترسی تیار. Like most of the population, Sheikh Fatallah was staying in Sulaimania at night. One morning, he was surprised by a dawn air raid. Man. دا که هات ما در و چند بمبر دومان، گریش ما بد درگاه خوامان، وقتی کم زنی تاریخ ل آسی استای مزار خانه کو، هات با کلانی مالی مفتی، بس آسمان، تاریخ آوا هات مالی از بگیش لواه، یکی من چون دانشتم آوا، تاریخ آوا هات کمبلکه فریه، و کو خوی تاریخ آوا کمبلکه آوا ها باتیجی. حیوانی مالی میزد توفیق برز بود و قاد بود. خون بلکه چون ناو حیوان کوا. که چون ناو حیوان کوا یه شان نتقی بود دارو فردا که فریا. فریا او داری داری خانو که تا پشتی منوا. که تا پشتی منوا تری او من نبود راکم. وقتی کم زنی گلهات و ای بسرما. گلاو او وقت دارو زلو او آنها و ای بسرما بوم بچر او. حتا ساعتی که پیشو تقریبا خلبه در تهرانم که هات ان هوارم کردیم بعد من نام اونتان لجور هم گلاد درم بینن که بخاک نازو پاش خریق ون لگرما بر پیش سمتم کو آممش کم آمیم موضوع که آواسن پاش لیانه گر کر راکشن بر سمتم کو او کلوتی اسکانی کلوتم شکاو من آن شص و نه سال آوام. Bombing of Sulaimania achieved its aims. The casualties and destruction to the city forced Sheikh Mahmoud into the mountains and the city was occupied by British troops. Trenchard's vision of the potential of air power had been vindicated. So much so that the colonial secretary in 1925, Leo Amory, wrote of Iraq, If the writ of King Faisal runs effectively throughout Iraq, it is entirely due to British aeroplanes. If the aeroplanes were removed tomorrow, the whole structure would inevitably fall to pieces. Yet the success could not hide some misgivings at the methods involved. A disturbing report reached Churchill of an incident where British pilots had machine-gunned women and children. In response, Churchill wrote to Trenchard, To fire willfully on women and children is a disgraceful act. I am surprised you did not order the officers responsible to be tried by court-martial. By doing such things, we put ourselves on the lowest level. In spite of Churchill's intervention, no action was taken. In fact, Trenchard took steps to censor reports before they reached his political masters. The documents proving this censorship were kept hidden by official secrecy for 50 years. In one letter, Trenchard instructed his commander in Iraq not to report tonnage of bombs dropped or casualties caused as the news that two tons of bombs have been dropped on some little village daily might give a wrong sense of proportion at home. In another letter, the Air Council asked for a report to be censored on the grounds that if this report as it stands were to get into the hands of undesirable people, harm might be done not only to the Air Force but also to His Majesty's government. However operational reports were censored back home, 
there was no avoiding the disquiet of many of the pilots ordered to carry out the bombing. My pilot was a flying officer, McNeil. We flew to Barzan and commenced bombing runs and machine gun attack. While McNeil, only having a wireless operator behind him, took practically no action, but just flew around the battlefield looking at it, and then flew off um, to find out what was, uh, what support or reinforcements there might be farther back. And we flew into the hills there. They were very close, of course. Um, and eventually found a couple of poor Kurds struggling up a, a mountainside with a donkey. Gale's pilot, McNeil, fired a burst of machine gun fire at the Kurds. My reaction was this. I had already spent uh, some years living with the Kurds. At Halebja, I lived right in the town with the Kurds all around me. I used to walk out and leave the doors open and everything else. And they, they virtually thought they were looking after me. And when McNeil had put his burst down, I was bloody annoyed. You, you know, when things get a little bit upset, you do get a bit tight, and it, it feels good to sort of let go with a gun. It, it's a feeling, perhaps, that it comes over you. I've experienced it. It's not um, something that you want to do. It's just you get carried away, I suppose, a bit, and uh, there you are. What sort of discussions did you have when you tr talked about it? How many? Did you kill anybody, do you think? Did you like it? You didn't? A discussion about the Kurds. Because previously you might have been out and had a tea party with them somewhere in one of the villages. They're not unfriendly people. They were much more jovial when you spoke to them and, uh, to my way of thinking, on a higher plane than the average Iraqi from the plains. Um, it was a, a, quite a joy to go up through the mountains and call into the various Kurdish villages built in the side of the hills, uh, where they always supplied you with uh, some tea and uh, fruit, and uh, you were always very welcome. So that uh, on those grounds alone, we had far more respect for the Kurd than we did for the Iraqi. They had some very fine principles which they lived by. And we should have been encouraging the, uh, the Kurds rather than siding with the gutter rats who were the Arabs. And they were gutter rats. I think there's a lot of feeling, were we doing the right thing? In, in what we were doing, uh, in the operations that were taking place. We were ordered to do it, and it was a job of work. But um, in view of what everybody knew, uh, did you feel really justified, apart from the time when you were fired on, or perhaps you thought your, life, your own life was in danger, and you thought you, ought to, you, know, you had to take some action and do something about it? But I'd, I, I'd never met anybody, really, that uh, enjoyed killing Kurds. I don't feel good about it. I still sort of read uh, and know what's going on, and I, I don't like it. Not one little bit. I think mostly, what is it? Political expediency. Politicians in Britain saw the experiment with air power in Iraq as an unqualified success. At a time of defence cuts and economic decline, the government regarded bombing as a cheap way of keeping control over the more rebellious frontiers of British rule. During the 1930s, bombers were sent to the Sudan, Egypt, Aden, and most importantly, the northwest frontier of India. The 
mountains of Waziristan are one of the most remote and inaccessible areas of Asia. Once the northwest frontier of India, this province is now a part of Pakistan. Every spring and autumn, nomads pass through. Sixty years ago, Waziristan was ruled by the British. Long after the pacification of the rest of India, the frontier remained unruly and warlike. The hills are still dotted with colonial forts, reminders of three wars against Afghanistan and countless tribal skirmishes. During the Raj, these forts were home to regiments of the British Indian Army, locally recruited soldiers commanded by British officers. Life on the frontier in the 1930s had changed little since the Victorian era. Inside the mess, officers lived a life of ease and tradition. When called into action, the Indian army fought a bloody guerrilla war against rebel tribesmen. As a young subaltern, Brigadier Prendergast won a military cross for bravery on the frontier. It was an extremely difficult area to control because it was inhabited by warlike tribesmen who had rifles and were excellent, excellent guerrillas fighting in country they knew. They knew every track and hillside and they were adepts at fighting at a guerrilla action. They were capable of any form of mayhem. They used to raid down into the settled districts and loot and murder. They also attacked convoys and um, fought among themselves a good deal too. The British tried to keep order it was a system of stick and carrot. The tribal leaders were rewarded with money for keeping the peace. But if they didn't keep the peace, uh, then out came the stick. In 1935, found by unrest elsewhere in India, the tribes of the frontier were edging into outright rebellion. The army became heavily engaged, fighting with the tribesmen. Back in London, the situation on the frontier raised the usual questions of cost and casualties. The Air Ministry was keen for the RAF to take an active role in suppressing the rebellion. But the political climate had changed since the 1920s. In particular, the critics of RAF bombing had gained ground. When the subject was debated in the House of Lords, it was strongly attacked by peers of all parties. One leading critic was Lord Plumer, a former High Commissioner for Palestine. If applied against the civil population, taking the form of destruction of villages and habitations, it is, I consider, a mischievous power. To my certain knowledge, the memories of those bombings will not be easily effaced. It nearly always happens that in these cases, women and children are killed or wounded. To counter criticism that bombing was uncivilized and un-British, the RAF was forced to use more humane tactics. The main change was in the use of warning leaflets. In Iraq in the 1920s, leaflets had sometimes been dropped but were not always considered necessary. But by 1936, bombing of tribal villages was forbidden unless warning had been given. In practice, once the leaflets had been dropped, the tactics remained the same as in Iraq. Aircraft were sent out to bomb and strafe villages. Many pilots took along home movie cameras to record the action the source of this rare archive film. The 
the procedure for a bombing raid, it started at dawn, and we nearly always bombed in threes. Of course, don't forget, we had no radio, no radar, nothing. All done by hand signals. And then we would bomb from 6,000 feet, and the outside aeroplanes, when they saw my bomb drop, would drop their bombs too, and the three bombs would go down to land in the village. And then we'd swing round, right round, and come back and see the, and the dust clouds and things, how good it really was. And that would go on all day. There's about a uh, ton and a half to two tons of bombs per flight, and we were normally operating three flights. So you get about 10 tons of bombs down during the day, which was enough to do quite a lot of damage in a small village. Leaflets were dropped. They were given three or four days warning. Nobody got killed, but the village was destroyed. Yes, it did cause hardship, and they knew it was coming. They knew what it was, but they were being bloody-minded, and they weren't going to kowtow to anybody. But usually, after the village had gone, they realized that the game wasn't worth the candle. And so we got peace without loss of life. The northwest frontier has changed little since the 1930s. To find out the effect of the RAF bombing, we went to Waziristan to find people who remember the raids. The air ministry maintained that because of the leaflets, the bombing caused no casualties. But was this always the case? <laughs> Even when people did receive warning of air raids, they didn't always leave their villages. Some members of the family stayed behind to guard the homes and look after livestock. Dat is wel bij ons ticht de gaten trap kreeg. 
Once the tribes people learned the pattern of the British bombing, they began to return to their damaged villages at night. To prevent this, the RAF began a series of night raids. The reason the raids went on for two or three days was to be sure that you had uh, knocked down virtually every building in the village. Now, the buildings were built of mud brick, and they had fighting towers, which were solid material up to the second story. And they would take a remarkable amount of damage before they actually fell down. And very easy to rebuild unless they were lying down flat. So we went on until they were virtually unrepairable. Mud bricks, a little bit of water, pack them in, and you've got your building back up again. So that had to be stopped to make the thing worthwhile. Once you're going to do it, do it properly. As the technology of bombing improved, the RAF were able to do more and more damage. One town called Shirani was singled out for retaliatory bombing after rebels killed an Englishman. Shirani was a big town very close to the Afghan frontier. They had done something rather awful to an English officer which they, who, who had they, they had captured. And um, so it was decided to um, really take it to pieces. Every squadron on the frontier, bombers and army cooperation and bomber transport put in two attacks per day and um, there was not much left of it by the time we'd finished after four days.
The bombing of villages was opposed by many soldiers stationed on the frontier. They believed it was unfair to make women and children suffer for the actions of their menfolk. The idea of dropping a bomb on a terrible tribesman from a great height, and it was very unlikely that he could stop the, the airplane from flying over. Uh, it, it seems to me uh, an unpleasant way of, of doing things. And it's much better that you had irregular troops, Pashtun-speaking troops, walking about on the ground, talking to people and discussing their problems with them. Whether women and children were allowed to get out in good time, that might solve a good many consciences. But we didn't like it very much. There was a sort of man-to-man feeling between us and the tribe. And in a funny way, it was sort of a game of cricket with blood. And, and meeting these tribesmen afterwards on convoys or on, on journeys, one reminisced so over these actions. And, and, and it was really rather like talking about a cricket season. We, we, there was a great fellowship between the uh, British and the tribesmen. He, he was a manly type and had a great sense of humor, too. To rule a country by saying we're going to bomb the daylight out of your village seems to me a, a very unjust way of, of doing it. As a last resort, okay, if, if a particular tribe continues to raid uh, towns and townships of Banu and that kind of thing, either they must come in and say, um, oh, sorry, we won't do it anymore, or you should go about it in a... Um, um, a more man-to-man -man way. But to drop large quantities of high explosive on them, a thing they could not really retaliate over, seems to me a, a, a very improper, not, not just unsporting, but a highly improper way of running a country. The practical value of the bombing was also debatable. The destruction of their homes made the rebel tribesmen even more hostile to British rule. Unable to shoot down aircraft, the tribesmen waited for an opportunity to revenge themselves on the British. In 1936, the RAF bombed a village in central Waziristan, killing two sons of the head man. On the 9th of April, 1937, a large convoy left Jandola in southern Waziristan. That morning, intelligence had been received that hostile tribesmen were massing in the hills. But against the advice of the political agent, the convoy did not turn back. Motor Park 
Tira vara otra, tira joda gurini tira pasar que vala que da muerte es vale. Ya que por obsesión que no hay saro vara de spoon y por ser daca lara. Pues damos de mi mac pero va que purena. Y en ya maca. Da spoon va vistar el bel cual cazó puta no se damos ahí. Over 80 servicemen were killed at Shahua Tangi, the biggest single loss of British life during the Waziristan Rebellion. After the massacre, RAF bombers were sent out to retaliate by destroying villages. Many surviving pilots argue that without the fear of retaliatory bombing, there would have been even more bloodshed on the frontier. The only thing which stopped the cycle of bombing and rebellion in Waziristan was the outbreak of another war in Europe. By 1940, all that lay between Britain and defeat by Germany was the RAF. To reinforce the overstretched squadrons at home, every available plane and pilot was recalled from the outposts of the empire. With hindsight, it is clear that the training provided to the RAF on the frontier was invaluable. The men who'd flown in colonial operations went on to form the backbone of wartime bomber command. But it is little comfort to the people of Waziristan that their remote villages provided valuable pre-war target practice for the RAF. And at the go hostarita, hostaver will be shown to go to Mr. Rashid. The Shadim Rumrish will give me Rumrish from Rams, from Rumrium, Amnina Rangsul, Katina Rangsul. The other got a good Shina Hamaham in the village at Asha Sweet. Sak Zalam Soid, Sak Kabur, Yotai Soid. Dear Man of Kundus will, dear Muswell, dear Halta Bab or Bootsu. You are Puna, the Yuan Cham, Racha Badni, you are Sarakari. Пахпала хора бунда да бадуш, качира хотес са бадвай халбата. 